We're going to start with the simplest possible case. We're going to treat our diatomic molecule as a molecular spring. Obviously, we only have to worry about the stretching modes. There are no bending modes in a diatomic molecule. So let's think about that diatomic vibration as a molecular spring. And what do we know about molecular springs? Well, if we set one moving, they undergo simple harmonic motion. So we describe the oscillatory motion of the mass on the end of our spring by this function, x, the displacement is x naught sine omega t, where x naught is the total amplitude of the vibration. One period of the vibration is going up, coming back through equilibrium and returning once again, and that corresponds to one complete sine wave. So we can say that one period is equal to 2 pi divided by omega, where omega is what we call the circular frequency. Okay, the frequency of our wave, or the frequency of our vibration, is given, of course, by 1 over the period. When we talk about simple harmonic motion, of course, we tend to talk about circular frequencies, but the frequency and the circular frequency are related by this relationship. Nu is equal to omega divided by 2 pi. Okay, so if we make that substitution, then our displacement is shown here. What else do we know about springs? Well, we know that forces in springs can be thought of in terms of Hooke's law. Hooke says that the restoring force is, is proportional to the displacement, and the constant of proportionality we call k, and for springs, k is what we call the spring constant. Okay, so we can now relate force to the displacement, and the displacement is, of course, already related in our simple harmonic oscillator. But we can also relate force to Newton's second law of motion. Force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. So our force is minus kx. That's the Hooke's law force. But the acceleration is the second differential of the displacement with respect to time also comes from Newton's second law of motion. But we've got an expression for the displacement up here. So to make progress is what we now have to do is differentiate this function twice. Okay, so it's still minus kx on the left side, so that's the first differentiation. We have to differentiate that once more. So we've now ended up with our time-dependent displacement again. This is exactly the same as where we started after two differentiations. So we can replace that by our displacement x. And we've now got a relationship between the spring constant, or let's start calling it the force constant, and the frequency, and indeed the mass at the end of our spring. So if we simply rearrange that equation, we end up with this important equation, that the frequency is 1 over 2 pi, square root of k, that's the force constant, the spring constant, divided by m. So we can see that the frequency scales with k. So if we have a strong spring, that means that k is big, then the frequency is going to be high, and if we have, conversely, a weak spring, small k, then the frequency is going to be low. In addition, the frequency scales with the square root of 1 over the mass. So if we make the masses smaller, we're going to make the frequency higher. And if we make the masses large, we're going to make the frequencies smaller. Okay, so all of that is appropriate for springs, and we're just going to say that our molecule can be represented as a kind of very small spring. And there's an example shown there. This is the HCl molecule. And to make this spring analogy precise, all I've done is clamp one end of it, H, so we've nailed the H atom to a wall or, or to the ceiling, by the look of it. And then we let the chlorine atom oscillate backwards and forwards, undergoing simple harmonic motion. If we measure the frequency of that, then we can extract the force constant of the bond. And if we, look at, if we compare that to other bonds, then we can see, is the HCl bond a strong bond? or a weak bond. We're not quite finished with our derivation yet because there's a problem with that analogy that I've, I've just made. I chose arbitrarily to clamp the H atom and stick it onto the ceiling. But of course my model is, is really artificial because we do not look at the chlorine atom stuck to the ceiling. The hydrogen nucleus and the chlorine nucleus move with respect to one another. So they move about some central position. So our picture of the masses is wrong. We have to have some kind of average mass. It turns out that the average mass we need is something called the reduced mass. And the reduced mass is given by the products of the masses of the two nuclei divided by their sum. So instead of using m in our equation, we use the reduced mass, and that gets around this problem of the clamped molecule. And then we can use this picture of a spring really very effectively to understand vibrational spectroscopy. So now if we measure the, the frequency of the bond and we know the masses of the two atoms involved, then we can extract the force constant, which is somehow related to the bond strength. So this is an important and 
useful results.